Okay, so welcome everybody to another webinar from uh, Doctors Up webinar series. For today, we have exactly a webinar on how difficult is it to write a doctoral research proposal. And let me perhaps first introduce you what, who we are, who is Dr. Tuck. Um, Dr. Tuck is an online mentoring community and we provide relevant advice to doctoral students on what to do next and how to do it quickly. Uh, our webinars cover topics that are frequently raised by our community members, but you are most welcome to also suggest a topic that you, that you like to have us uh, addressed. Um, our webinars are recorded and they are made available afterwards, so no need of taking notes. You'll be able to replay uh, at, at your convenience. Um, questions are welcome during the webinar, either raise your hand and unmute yourself or write them in, into the chat. Uh, Jack and I will be keeping an eye on that. Um, after the recording is turned off, so typically there is a period where we, we discussed and is recorded, but we also allow for questions off the records. Um, this is typically a part of the webinar that is very rich because it's where everybody, you know, like is, is, uh, is in a safe environment to, to, to ask any type of questions that they didn't want to have um, on the public recording. Um, today, we, are, we have with us Professor Dr. Steve McCabe. He is one of our mentors, basically. Um, and he, you can find him in a number of workshops, so uh, have everything, I will, I will discuss that a bit. Uh, can, can we move the slide, please? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely, sorry, okay. So during this webinar, exec, we, we, we want to discuss, to get you a better understanding about the various challenges that students experience during their doctoral research proposal development, and exactly how these challenges could be overcome. Next, please. Okay, no problem. This is kind of a let's call it appetizer, yeah, because obviously uh, we have we we have a service portfolio that goes from the webinars uh, on this specific topic and also on the identifying the research gaps. We do have available workshops. You will be able to have a one on one or a half day group uh, session, be it with Professor Stephen, be it with any other of our mentors. Okay, to, to move on again? Yes, please. Okay, <laughs> sorry. There is also exactly a club that meets each Fridays at 9 a.m. Uh, this is exactly a club dedicated and led by Dr. Andres Meisner, one of our co-founders, and is specifically dedicated to those ones that are at the doctoral, uh, at the research stage, and exactly to, to move further and to manage to finalize their, their, their research uh, proposal. There are two courses as well, one exactly focusing on the issue identification, problematization, and research questions framing, and the other subsequent one on developing your doctoral research proposal. Uh, all of our courses are available on a self-study uh, mode, or exactly if you if you like to take a, to, to be an on-one one um, taken through the course, we offer a tutored uh, mentored option. And I think that now I will pass the session to Professor Stephen that exactly could take over the session. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Anna. Uh, okay, um, this is me. Okay, I'm um, a, a lecturer, researcher, and there's other things that uh, I won't bore you with at uh, Bowman City University. And indeed, one of my previous roles was uh, uh, director of research degrees. And one of the things that, so for the business school, and one of the things that um, I had to do as part of that role was to sort of review all of the research applications and research applications are sort of pretty standard in many ways. Um, quite clearly you, you look for, for certain things, but most particularly you look at the sort of proposals. So I've seen a fair few proposals in my time and what you learn to sort of to, to, to develop is an understanding of, of how much thought has gone into that proposal. And without sort of um, you know, getting to the conclusion, and I think we all know the conclusion, what makes a really good proposal, in my opinion, um, and this will probably come as no shock, is something that's really well thought out. It's uh, probably very original because, of course, that's what the eventual doctoral uh, work will be judged upon, its contribution to knowledge. Um, but, but so it's originality, well thought out. 
and and most particularly the, the the applicant has put the sort of the amount of effort that is expected to sort of demonstrate that they'll be able to sort of to um, make this thing work and and dare i say it, it, perhaps turn it the other way around it's easy to talk about what is a good proposal and what you look for. What makes for a bad proposal, in my opinion, are those which are, and again, I'm I'm just thinking of the sort of the worst. I've seen some pretty dreadful ones. That the one thing not to do, and um, I had this happen a couple of times, where people clearly that they, they they just um, not copied, you know, but, um, but they'd certainly sort of taken sort of existing ideas and they hadn't really thought it through but the, there's a whole sort of set of other sort of things that sort of come into play um which yeah, yeah, those of you that are sort of um, possibly already involved in research may know but but i assume everyone is is at this sort of stage is to sort of to put the sort of sufficient amount of time into sort of developing the proposal and what i mean by that this is not a trivial activity because like everything the more you do at the beginning, the more likely it is that you're going to sort of develop a really good um, application. And more particularly, that if that application is then accepted, you're going to be able to do the research in a sort of an efficient and effective way. Um, and it, it becomes a lot better. So this preparation at the beginning and lots of thought really sort of pays dividends. And dare I say, I'll uh, move on to sort of next. So, OK, I mean, basically, you can sort of see there. Um, hopefully i've sort of summarized that and i'm not going to sort of i'm just trying to sort of move the sort of the the um uh, pictures of everyone uh, to the right hand side so so again yeah a good doctor of research um or good research proposal it's providing a lot of information um that will sort of appear in the sort of the, the thesis um although though I, you know the one thing i always sort of say and, and again uh, this will hopefully sort of come out in the sort of the the discussion that, that it doesn't have to be sort of cast in stone um, just because your sort of proposal said one thing at that particular sort of stage, when you come to write up your thesis, which for a full-time student you'd expect to be sort of two and a half, three years later, and for a part-time student, five, maybe six years later, and often sort of those those time frames are longer, it's kind of inevitable and very understandable that the sort of proposal may morph in different ways. And dare I say it, that is not a problem. Um, obviously, you've got to start somewhere. But in the sort of the course of carrying out research, aspects of, sort of what you intend to do may change, circumstances change, supervisors change, unfortunately, because you know, the, um, nobody's ever sort of there forever. Um, so so it's it, it, but it's a kind of if we were looking at a contract, it's an invitation to treat as they sort of say in contractual terms. OK, and I think I've labored this enough. It, it may appear a simple and straightforward process. But it's not. It's um, it's something as we're going to discuss in the sort of next uh, few minutes, which should be sort of um, require a fair amount of thought. OK, OK. How long should it be? Um, well, I think that it's got to be about fifteen hundred to two thousand words. But you know, given the sort of the amount of information this thing contains, it's, it's it, there's an old line. I wrote you a long document or I wrote you a long letter as the sort of the the, the, um, um, the metaphor goes because I didn't have time to just write a short one. And the, what I mean by that, it's easy to sort of to put lots of things in. And you know, quite often th this is the difficulty with some proposals that they contain a lot of information, but it's disjointed. It, it hasn't been sort of thought through. And dare I say it, writing in its, its is a very difficult process. And I do enough of this to know that so I've been able to write short, punchy documents which have been sort of clearly sort of thought through is a sort of big challenge. But what are you looking for? Well, because, you know, dare I say it, that, you know, in my sort of role and, um, you know, typically you might get sort of um, on a weekly basis, you might get one a day and, and sometimes it's more than that. So your ability to read through everything is, you know, the time is limited. And most particularly, um, if, because I used to do the sort of the first tranche, as it were, of sort of looking at proposals, you, you need to sort of be able to sort of glean the most important information in a sort of as, as succinct a way as possible. So writing something which is has clarity and sort of precise definition is a really important sort of skill, as it were. So that's the what, as it were. I, I mentioned this, it's you know, contribution to knowledge. Ultimately, what you've got to remember, the whole point about sort of doing a doctorate is that it is going to be sort of judged by um, external peers, external exams. Sorry, well, let me sort of clarify that by by peers 
one of whom, and maybe a number of whom, could be external, and there will also normally be an internal examiner. But these academic referees judge the sort of the worth of the piece of work as a uh, contribution to the canon of knowledge. Uh, that that's the sort of the standard sort of expectation of any piece of research work. Um, and if it doesn't sort of uh, contribute, then um, it's not judged to be sort of worthy by the referees. And in which case, then um, it, 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 it's in danger of failing. So that, that and, and you know, we we don't talk about failure, but but it's always a sort of inherent danger. So, and this is why, and and there's so much latitude in this that, that it, it's not a problem. But if you're doing something which is well trodden territory, if I may say, um, it's been done umpteen times before. You've got to sort of show how what you're doing is different in some way. Where is the sort of the the, the bit that is going to be sort of innovative and creative? And dare I say, it, that's an acid test, which any sort of examiner is looking for, the contribution. And also the other thing, which I'm sure any of you that, that have started to look at research and been involved in, it's the sort of how you're going to do it. And you know, dare I say it, that uh, it's very easy to say, I'd like to do something. But of course, um, the, the expression I really like is that by what means, how are you going to sort of to glean the data and what are the sort of the, the practical aspects of whether it be getting into organizations interviewing people sending questionnaires um is the sort of the and i've seen a couple of these in my sort of career or probably more than i sort of care to sort of to um uh, reconsider uh, where people that clearly want to do things which are really sensitive and you know studying really sensitive organizations um brings with a whole set of other circumstances and moral aspects and indeed dare i say it when you go to any university um your research proposal will probably well undoubtedly in this day and age have to be passed by the sort of the ethics committee so um going and sort of saying i'm going to do undercover research um in an organization because they won't give me access any other way um that that's a really difficult one not impossible but but you'd have to sort of to justify what the sort of the aspects of this are and you know, that there's uh, we'll come back to this um, and, and there are plenty of other courses that sort of deal with this but you you would have to sort of to show why um this was the only way of doing it so in, in um summary you know the, the it, to be persuasive if it does all of those things it's got a really good chance of sort of success um because of course that's what you want your proposal to do is to be persuasive and most particularly to attract the sort of the attention and support of potential supervisors and of course, the other thing is that sort of you you make your proposal as much as you dare uh, fit the sort of the research expertise of the sort of the institution that you're at, because of course, what you you really desire is to have good supervisors who know the subject and can give you sort of advice and guidance in what already exists, uh, albeit that you'll have um, skimmed the surface for the proposal. You wouldn't expect it at this stage to be an expert, but you should have demonstrated that you've done some cursory um and tentative sort of research in the area and then it kind of aligns with sort of the, the expertise of a particular person in a particular department why is it important well i and i dare i say i, mean, I, I, I this this slide probably summarizes everything that, as we've sort of said it's because people are going to look at this and they're going to sort of judge your capability on the sort of the base of what they sort of they read and as i say supervisors don't have to sort of take on board um, students and indeed quite often sort of, um, most supervisors I've ever come across are overloaded anyway so taking an extra student on is something that has to be really compelling so what they're going to look at is you know is the sort of work valuable does it sort of help them because of course academics are sort of um, I don't mean to make out that they're self-serving but they're looking for something that's going to sort of align with their expertise and dare I say it, the best research is something which is going to sort of contribute to their expertise or they're going to be able to sort of to develop um, research outputs on the basis of what you write. Indeed, the sort of the most fruitful sort of relationships are those which are, you know, they become, yeah, there's this, yeah, I've seen various ways of demonstrating this, but they start off where the sort of the supervisor is the sort of the dominant personality. Um, but as the sort of the research progresses, the sort of the supervisor becomes less dominant but still important and then it becomes much more of a sort of collaborative arrangement so they're looking for something which is valuable but of course as i've also sort of indicated it's got to be doable it's got to be something that can be achievable in the sort of the time frame and the sort of the resource base that you've got so they're looking at sort of the general approach if you can see the cursor here and the methodology and also of course the sort of the, the likely time frame and feasibility is is uh, key to this you know what do you want to do and can, can it be done 
okay, easy question to sort of ask, not always easy to answer, um, because of course, as I also <laughs> indicated, sometimes these things don't become really sort of uh, apparent and explicit until you're sort of actually sort of doing it, and then you sort of uh, come across the sort of the issues. And of course, there are a whole sort of set of other issues that you need, um, as I've said, uh, resources, and literature and um, key texts and sort of access to reports. Uh, all of these things are things that you'll need to have sort of considered in the outset, albeit that, as I say, you probably don't know everything until you sort of start, but, but you should have done enough to demonstrate that you've thought through these issues. And as I've sort of also said, it'll undoubtedly morph. You know, as I say, every research proposal, and, and dare I say it, when you get to your viva, nobody produces your sort of proposal and says, well, this is what you said you were going to do. Um, but having said that, I also think that it, you know, three years on or whatever it might be, when you do write up your thesis, it, it may be sort of very uh, helpful to sort of to, to talk about the sort of the issues and challenges and the way that you you uh, contemplated them and dealt with them and you altered sort of your approach or sort of the um, the um, uh, literature that you used uh, that you you thought that you're going to use and how it sort of it it, it, it yeah it, it um, transitioned from sort of one thing to another because of course that's a very valuable part of the sort of the learning process okay and did I've said here an aid memoir. Um, to, yeah, to clarify initial ideas and to measure progress. And, and, and yeah, the more work you've done in this regard, the, the more light it is that you're going to sort of make effective progress. Because yeah, to, to, to state again what may seem very obvious, um, if you manage to get onto a programme and you've not thought through the sort of the, the proposal particularly well, um, that's when it starts to sort of become difficult, and that that's where it's sort of the it, it, the um, the research work can actually start to sort of to become. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, I was going to say, so um, it, it sort of it stalls, you know, because of course you have to rethink all that you sort of um, wanted to do in the the, um, the first um, uh, stages. And indeed, you know, dare I say, I've, I've come across plenty of instances where the sort of research proposal had a lot to recommend it, um, and the supervisory team that that were involved liked it. But they sort of they they said, well, we wouldn't do it like this, or we do something different. And of course, that's where the sort of expertise of the supervisors becomes absolutely sort of crucial. But of course, getting them to sort of be interested in the first place is key to success. Okay, I'm going to whiz through this pretty quickly because, of course, this is fairly standard information. But and I don't want to get to the sort of discussion. Established thinking, um, wisdom, knowledge, call it what you will. I mean, essentially, what this this means. Uh, what I'm saying is that sort of you've got to start somewhere. You look at the literature. What does the theory say? Theories are sort of just explanations. And of course, the whole point about theory, it's a constantly moving sort of um, feast, as it were. Um, and of course, that's the nature of research. And of course, the whole sort of thing about sort of um, uh, what's known as sort of um, 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 paradigms, you know, which is the sort of the word from Thomas Kuhn, the, the famous uh, book, you know, paradigms exist. It, for, for as long as, of course, the sort of the established wisdom says that this is, this is what it's about. As soon as the paradigm changes because of sort of current research, then the sort of the paradigm shifts to something different. And that's part of what ongoing research is always about, sort of uh, pushing forward the boundaries of knowledge, which is what any PhD or any sort of doctoral piece of work, because I'm also including some professional doctors in this, um, that they, they are part of this process. And indeed, the, the hope is, of course, that this work will be written up, um, certainly in the thesis, but, but subsequent to the thesis, it will be published in um, academic journals, books, whatever it might be, to sort of to inform the sort of academics and indeed, as as, as important and perhaps even more so, practitioners. And, and just as, as a footnote, I mean, I haven't worked with um, medics, but but I know enough for what, what medics do. Um, it's a constantly sort of shifting um terrain as it were um you know let's face it the last couple of years was about covid we know far more about coronaviruses than we did say three years ago uh, because of course a lot of sort of uh, intellectual firepower was dedicated to a better understanding and trying to obviously solve the problem and hopefully of course we sort of um we expect to make it sort of um uh well, create prevention so we don't sort of have another pandemic uh anytime soon although unfortunately i think uh, another pandemic um, is kind of inevitable given the sort of the way that sort of humanity uh, works in um, conjunction with the planet. But, hey, that's another story. I also so mentioned this: the grey literature, the, the published literature is one thing, but of course the the so-called grey literature and what that exists because of course it's it's not published in the sort of formal sort of ISBN way in a book or sort of an academic referee journal, but of course and particularly as I was just indicating, sort of if you're working sort of with practitioners. 
um, a lot of what they sort of they're guided by in their sort of their daily professional lives is you know, things you know, reports which may come from professional bodies so it's kind of status is is, is less um, clear cut but nonetheless it has a huge influence and indeed internal reports can be sort of hugely influential in terms of thinking and just to add in and I when I was doing my PhD you know, a million years ago um, was was much well how would I put this I, I, I was kind of focused and obsessed if you like on the sort of the academic literature and as I sort of began to realize practitioners you know by the way I was looking at quality management so and I'm not going to bore you all the details about that but uh, practitioners don't tend to read academic texts and you know I, 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 if I ever believed it I, I certainly don't believe it now um, why would they but they do read lots of what I call practitioner orientated literature which may be published but but again it comes in the trade literature and, and dare I say it, not to sort of to recognize its importance would be to miss um, something which is absolutely sort of essential. Most particularly what I always like in any sort of proposal is, and particularly if you can put this into a diagrammatic form, because it's so helpful to see it pictorially, is what I call a conceptual framework, which is where you extract all the key concepts and put it into a diagram, which summarizes what the background to this is, how it all fits together, where you fit in and what what bits of it you're going to test if, if that's what you you so desire in terms of sort of you know hypothetical deductive stuff which is um that the normally sort of associated with the scientific realm or more particularly and this is what i do prefer to explore in terms of sort of the uh, what what's going on and how by eliciting data from uh, whichever sources that you think are absolutely relevant how you're going to sort of assemble this and then sort of compare the sort of the theories to the practice and then make sort of logical and coherent conclusions, which will be sort of part of the, the doctoral work. So as I say, they're really helpful to sort of to get your ideas across in a really sort of um, clear, punchy and sharp way, because of course, you know, coming back to this, this thing, the proposal is to sort of to persuade the potential supervisory team. Aims and objectives, okay, I'm, I'm really conscious that um, I thought, thought I'd get through this much quicker, but um, yeah, you can read this, what do you want to do? What's the aim? So what's the, what are you trying to achieve? What's the purpose of the work? Well, of course, it is to sort of to research particular area and contribute to knowledge. Are you addressing gaps? And if if not, um, why not? Because of course, gaps are really useful. Because of course, that's the bit that you fill in. And uh, dare I say it, if you have spot a gap, then of course that that's the bit that that will certainly contribute. And of course, your proposal will be accepted. And indeed, more particularly, when you get to the viva by demonstrating that you've showed how you've closed the gap. Then of course that becomes the sort of the thing that will sort of allow you to sort of to um, achieve the sort of doctoral uh, doctoral qualification or to sort of to be a, you know, a successful doctoral candidate, as we sort of say in the sort of the, the business. Okay, but also it should have theories, and again, let's not get sort of too hung up on this, but there, there should be some um, basis for sort of the, this work because of course it's about sort of testing knowledge, and you know, literature is the sort of the beginning of the sort of the process right at this stage, and certainly at the end. As I keep saying, contribution to knowledge. Well, you, you, you've got to contribute somehow or other, and it, this is where the sort of the the, the the acid test is. How did it sort of make theory better? And you know, dare I say, you know, theory people get, you know, they have all sorts of sort of um, uh, notions of what theory is. It's explanations. Um, you know, I, I I believe that the sort of there are um, creatures living on Mars. Well, okay, it's a ridiculous theory, but it, yeah, okay. But of course, um, you could sort of say, well, test it. I you know, I, I I believe that there will be sort of humanity living on the moon in my lifetime. But at the moment, it's just a sort of a theory. But who knows? You know, we're told it will happen in the next ten years. Hopefully, I'll live that long. Um, but you know, and that's part of what the sort of process is. And dare I say, hundred years ago, so the notion of sort of humanity walking on the moon would have seemed ridiculous. Now we have the technology to do it. Okay. Anyway, um, also, you know, here's another one. Is there something you're trying to prove or disprove? But but dare I say it, sort of um, that that that's this is more difficult in the sort of the area that sort of I'm most comfortable in. And dare I say, it, my background was engineering, so I do understand the sort of the 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 um, um, how you work with sort of uh, objective data. Um, when you're sort of working in, with materials, which of course have physical properties. But when I worked in business, a lot of what goes on is about sort of social systems and they're about people. And I would uh, I always say that you know, when I see proposals about sort of working organizations where people are going to sort of hypothesis test, you know, uh, remember, pe people are um, 
nothing if not sort of um, inherently int uh, and intrinsically sort of unpredictable. It's what makes us interesting. We are not robots, um, but dare, dare I say it, so it's not impossible. And indeed, I see a lot of sort of management business research, which is about hypothesis testing and using all the sort of the, the scientific tools. Fine, but you've got to sort of, uh, you've got to believe in it. I'm not sure I do, but they, uh, that's another story. Okay, the, the methods, uh, what you are demonstrating here most particularly is the sort of and this, this is what's known as well there's, there's the ontology and of course i've not included these words but you can look these up ontology is what's the nature of the sort of the, the thing that you're looking at and in fact i was just giving you sort of a very crude overview in um science it's about sort of physical things such as whatever it might be in the, the, you know, when you when you set a rocket into space it has to do certain things. It has to conform to the, so the laws of physics as we understand them. I mean, who knows? Um, there are maybe things in the universe and they, they don't comply to the same laws that we understand, but we don't know that yet. Um, talk to the sort of physicists. But nonetheless, you design rockets to do certain things within the, sort of the, the physical constraints and the sort of the, the, as I've talked, the laws of physics. But of course, if you're going to sort of put humans into space, that's a different ball game. And of course, they they have to sort of they they, they have a different set of sort of criteria and people the long term space. There's the sort of the physiological aspects of you know people being sort of in space for you know, months, maybe years, and also the psychological aspects and psychology is this kind of it's a very slippery. Um, I mean, I, no disrespect to, to psychologists, but we are not machines, and you know, but the, the the idea of being sort of isolated in space is difficult. My point about all this is the ontology needs to be understood so you've got to get your head around that and then most particularly as i was sort of trying to sort of get to there's what we sort of call the epistemological question is what's the most appropriate way to research them so as as i've been saying for the last couple of moments um if you're going to sort of study sort of things which have physical uh, properties then there are ways to do that if you're going to study things which have sort of a much more subjective aspect than human beings then use a sort of range of techniques which are sort of available there and that's the quantitative qualitative aspect you know positive is anti-positive and you'll see all of this in the sort of the, the research literature and there are loads of courses which uh, dr hub do on that okay so the, the the most important thing is that you've got to sort of try to sort of consider this and that the, the best proposals are those which but they, they this, the applicant has considered what might be possible and they've they, they, they think they're going to use a lot of sort of uh, maybe a range of techniques uh, but you know and the best i think are always where the students are sort of willing to sort of be um advised and guided to use different approaches but at least the, sort of the very nature of this is that you know if, if you get something i'm just going to send 100 questionnaires and that's it you know that that's their only contribution to the methodology it shows to probably a distinct lack of sort of thinking through what 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 they're going to do and how they're going to do it and we're going to discuss this and okay right yeah i keep emphasizing this but they were um where's the sort of the current research deficient yeah. and of course by identifying that there's your gap what impact will your research have Well, you hope of course it is regarded as being the sort of the the, the contribution and fixing the gap that exists um how will it apply in new contexts and and uh, will it sort of provide knowledge which is useful to academics and more especially if you're sort of working in the sort of the field of practice how will sort of people use this and, and dare i say it, the sort of uh, that that might sound like a throwaway comment but again excuse me i've got a itchy nose that in medicine um yeah i, I think it's probably the best model if you if you, if you will where medics you know, they they, they you know, what they want are things which are going to sort of make people better or well prevent them from being sick in the first place and make them better if they do so this is a it's a constantly shifting field excuse me oh um and dare i say it, so yeah you know, the 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 um the model of, of medics is that sort of they, they they often sort of um research or do their sort of research in the morning in, in universities and then they go and, um implement it in the afternoon or vice versa so it's just a really symbiotic relationship and i think that that's really key to success because i think this sort of the best research um, particularly in sort of the lights of management and business which is what i'm most familiar with is that which is then applied in um or it's, it's given to practitioners it makes their sort of their world better and indeed in my own sort of piece of research yeah all i did it was what i said all i did it was a typology of the sort of the approaches that sort of should be used by sort of those um implementing quality management what makes it more successful and by understanding that then it's more likely that you're going to sort of to practitioners in the future are going to do it better 
But of course, you know, coming back to sort of to what I've been saying, at the very outset, which is what the sort of the pose should be, it's persuasion why your sort of research is essential and it should be supported. Stress the understanding and generation of new information or new knowledge and demonstrate how your research is innovative and original. And Ken, finally, um, I, I talked about sort of the, the plan. Think about what you're going to do and think carefully how you're going to sort of to achieve it in the time frame. And, you know, again, when you get a sort of piece of research or a proposal that says it's going to complete a full time PhD in a year and a half, you, you know that the, the, this student really hasn't or this applicant, I should say, hasn't really thought it through. There's a good reason why full time PhDs take three years and plus and part time PhD, so part time doctorates, I keep saying. Um, uh, because it PhDs and doctorates, so um, to sort of come the whole gamut of sort of approaches that they they take five, six, seven, and possibly even eight years uh, to do it part time. Things do not often work in the way that you want, but but nonetheless, you should have an achievable time frame which is realistic. The resources that you're going to sort of need in terms of access to data and your ability to dedicate time, which of course, uh, particularly if you're a part time student, may be limited. So don't, don't overstretch yourself. Because uh, that's always a recipe for sort of for um, for things to sort of become problematic. Um, think about the organisation that you want to access. You know, if you're doing in your own organisation, are there sort of going to be uh, impediments placed in uh, put in place by managers above you, or more particularly, if you're going to sort of to get access to external organisation that you don't belong to, why would they allow this? You've got to be able to sort of think through the, the reasons why that they would give you sort of the access that you're after which of course is about confidentiality um an organization you know they're under no uh, obligation to sort of to to allow you access um but but they will do so if they they can be persuaded also so again think about that think about the problems that you're going to encounter because of course even at this sort of stage by so sort of doing um the more you sort of pre-plan the more likely you are going to be to have the sort of the resources and the sort of the the um the competency and confidence to deal with them and indeed you know i, I say that in exactly next bullet point Demonstrate confidence um, because once you've done this, this is what will sort of persuade the potential supervisory team. And of course, perhaps finally show the sort of list of references view, views because, of course, that's what every piece of academic work should have a list of sort of references as to where you got your information from, the key sources. Um, and it is one of my banes of life. So whenever I'm sort of editing pieces, the people that they, 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 people have some very peculiar ways of referencing very sloppy uh, methods. And it takes a, a naught amount of time then to sort of chase up and find out where they got the information in the first place or the knowledge. OK, I think I, I'm going to take a, a moment to sort of catch my breath. So I'll get Anna back in. Thank and you. And we're into, we're into discussion. Um... To stop sharing that we could see each other. Oh, sorry, just uh, uh, forgive me. Yeah. All right. So now we are back here to the main room. Um, and I think I first would like to to learn if the audience has any question. Otherwise, I'm definitely happy to 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 start it. Any question from the audience? You can also type it in the chat if you need. I think we have to, we have do actually have, have some chat which I'm. Being, yeah. Oh, it's, it's just yeah, they're just in general. The <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing Very good there. presentation, what you can't. Okay. So then let me perhaps um, start. Um, we often hear from students that you know, like they understand each single word of this, you know, like this the advice that is out there. That that that's you know, like what what needs to be within a proposal, um, but that they still do not know how to do it, how to start. Yeah. Um, is there, you know, like any piece of advice or, you know, like how do you usually work with your doctoral students? Um, where should a student start, basically? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that is freely available, um, well, the proposals to tend to sort of float about, as you know, on the, so the internet. And I've got no problem whatsoever with people sort of looking at sort of uh, proposals. Indeed, some universities that they, they the um, confidentiality is notwithstanding, they put the sort of proposals on the sort of the, the net um, uh, because, of course, it, it's helpful for students to think about what they are. But, but dare I say, every proposal will have all the sort of the elements that I've just sort of um, been through. Uh, and dare I say, you know, I, I don't, uh, well, I, I, I don't um, have any hesitation in, in acknowledging the fact that sort of all the things I've talked about 
um, been able to compact into a sort of a 1500 to 2000 word um, document is, is no mean feat. But what I would say is that sort of if you can find good proposals, then you'll probably sort of see why that they are um, extensive but pithy. And I know that that might seem sort of a sort of contradiction, but 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 it, it, it's not impossible to sort of write these things. And and writing economically is, if I may say so, you know, saying saying what you want to say in as few words as possible is a real skill. And you know, take it from me, I find it difficult. Um, but but yeah, D dare I say? And, and I know this might sound. Um, uh, as if I'm giving some not useful advice, but look at the way that sort of journalists operate, because journalists increasingly um, they 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 have to sort of to get stories over in a sort of a way which, of course, is very compact. And I think that that that, that skill of writing and sort of summarising ideas, and dare I say, it, and using sort of diagrams, of course, that's the other thing. I think diagrams are really helpful, and you, you may have come across things called mind maps and whatever else. But but most particularly, and to try and answer the question from from Anna, is that if you can, it, it, what students often do is, of course, that they that they they talk about things in a sort of very abstract way, and that, but but they don't sort of link it through in terms of sort of the, the way in which it all fits together and by sort of doing this work which actually may take a bit of time I, and i think that maybe i didn't sort of um, uh, emphasize this enough y your proposal may take a couple of months to put together this is not something you're going to do in a couple of hours um but to do it properly and well uh, um, and spending many weeks on this is a sort of no bad thing so uh, what would you do go to university departments and see if they've they've got good proposals but don't just copy them because of course that then you know all you do is is provide something which is derivative talk to sort of the department in the first instance can quite often that they will help you to sort of develop a proposal um talk to other sort of phd students if you've got access to them because of course they'll be really helpful in sort of telling you what what the um a good proposal is about um that there are probably sort of books helping you to sort of to write this. I mean, I suppose I should have sort of referred to one, but but I, I don't think you necessarily need to do that. As long as you've sort of thought through the issues and the way that I've outlined in the sort of the um, uh, the slides, it, it should probably work. But recognise also that, as I say, nothing is ever perfect. And the more time you put on it, the better. And the more, um, how can I put this? The, the, so the, the, and also recognise that this, your thinking at, sort of, uh, at this stage is probably not going to be as advanced, but well, it shouldn't be as advanced as it's going to be in three years as a full-time sort of um, uh, doctoral candidate or five, six, seven years as a part-time doctoral candidate. Um, and that's the sort of, you know, everyone understands that. I'd hope that that, that provides some sort of elaboration. Well, definitely, and exactly also the, the, the topics that you addressed during this webinar, they are, we come back to them during those two advanced courses that I exactly just advised at the beginning of this, this webinar. Uh, in to trying to exactly take uh, a doctoral student step by step towards the next stage of his, his doctoral research. Um, we have a question. Oh, I did, there is a question. Oh, yeah, good. We, we've uh, exactly. I, I'm just going to read it out. Okay. Yeah, well, you, 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 you read it out. <laughs> no, you can also. I'm fine. I have been struggling to identify the theoretical framework. Is it left to the researchers, or are there ways to say one framework is better than the other? If I'm honest, I, I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question insofar as the, all a theoretical framework is or conceptual framework, and I think we've done a, a webinar on that um, in the last year or so. Yeah, concepts are just the sort of the, the key elements. You know, what what is it that you know, if I talk about business management, motivation, that's a concept, but there are lots of models in motivation, um, and some of them work, some of them don't. So, so my my point being that your framework should be something which has relevance and it is cogent and and and, and just to sort of clarify what i mean is that so what what students offset applicants i should say applicants tend to do is that they because they're not quite sure whether it's about this or this or this they over complicate it by but it becomes if i might call it a sort of a um a minestrone if you, if you, and a minestrone is lots of different ingredients and it, and it becomes lots of sort of things, and it's it, uh, well, and all a good framework should be is a sort of summary of what you think are the key elements. And and, and the, the advice I'm giving here is, if you've got too many competing frameworks or too many concepts, then it becomes 
um, uh, there's a conflict, and I think that that becomes part of the difficulty. But but I mean, again, I'm, I'm just coming back to the question of struggle to develop a, a theoretical framework. The only advice I think I, or the best advice I can give to you, if you keep it simple in the first instance, that's more likely to be successful than uh, developing sort of something which is over complex and, and contains too many different things which are sort of going to sort of to not be impossible. But, but you, you, you know, if you see a proposal and it's got, I don't know, uh, for argument's sake, di different disciplines, cross-disciplinary research are always the most difficult um, because, of course, you, you, you've got to try and be an expert in this and this and this. And therefore, that they are the sort of things which which cause the sort of the the, um, the, the big problems for sort of for students and um, the, the academic staff. I, I, you know, and, and it's difficult because I, 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 if the person that has asked the question would wish to elaborate why it's difficult to write the sort of proposal, then I'd be more than happy to 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 um, give more advice. It's because it's always difficult, and, and and in the first instance, if to just to, to get to. Uh, the conclusion of this is that sort of, uh, students think that the proposals should be complicated and my advice uh, on the basis of having been in academia for 35 years is um, any piece of research that, that starts off complex well any anything it, it always gets more complex so if it's complex to start off with it's going to get even more complex and that's what becomes unmanageable dare I say yeah, exactly. I would like to invite, if you like, to unmute yourself and develop a bit further about your question. Uh, later on, I will also post at the forum, uh, because we, we address this topic of the difference between uh, a theoretical and a conceptual framework. So I'll post the links to those webinars at the forum. So please, if you like, then to unmute and exactly develop. Thank you. I'm sorry for the background noise. Um, so... Uh, I'm. I want to work in the field of education, and there is a specific uh, question that I'm interested in. But when I start reading papers, uh, I see that there are different people uh, coming up with different uh, frameworks. So I'm interested in the area of teacher professional development. So there are different people saying this is the main. This sh these should be the main elements of training teachers. Somebody else says something else. So then it becomes very confusing and overwhelming. So is it just up to us to decide which one I want to choose or uh, are there ways to decide uh, this is better than the other? I hope if, I'm if I may answer that one and Anna may have a different view or, or uh, Jack, who's also um, a member of doctoral um, hub staff. Um, if I can say to you, there's no such thing as complete knowledge. And what I mean by that is that in any discipline, there's a kind of a huge spectrum of you know, theories, models, call them what you want. And we, we, we kind of think these words are used in a sort of very interchangeable way. And I, I, if I understand you talked about professional development in education, well, yeah, I mean, all you can do, you can't research everything. So it sounds to me like that you, what you need to do is to sort of to recognize that the sort of the field is this big. And the more that you can sort of bound it, and look at just one particular aspect, and again, I, you know, I've been in education. Well, select the one that you think most interests you in terms of sort of particular um, aspect or a particular model that, that is current, perhaps, um, or maybe even not current, but, but yeah, or maybe it's, 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 it's very radical. But you select one and just focus in on that. But also keep but bear in mind that if you're going to research this, you've got to get data and think about, well, where's the data going to come from? And so what I would say to you is that sort of if, if and again, if you work in education, um, then yeah, look around you, what's going on and do that, you know, or as I keep stressing, how are you going to sort of to operationalize what you do, I, where are you going to get the data from and what will be the sort of practical aspects of accessing that data and more particularly sort of um, publishing it, although that there are uh, ways and means of sort of um, uh, creating anonymity. But, but and of course, and that's why something like professional development works really well if you want to use a case study approach, um, whether you, you're involved in the case study, so it becomes, it's obviously reflected in terms of your own practice, but more um, possibly it's something where you sort of do, do you access a sort of a, um, a case study, but then that provides its own challenges also. Anna, uh, Jack, any views? Thank you, Stevie. Yeah, that is helpful. 
No, so, nothing. Bad. We have exactly one one raised hand and one comment in the chat. Which one would you like to address first? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll go to Sahel okay. and, and then okay. I'll, 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 I'll I read struggle, the question afterwards. Okay, exactly. I struggle to define the scope of the research, meaning the how. How am I going to solve the problem? Also, in order to have robust research, I should collect data from many organizations, as many as possible. And I start to wonder whether this will be realistic, considering some of them are my competitors. Sometimes I feel I was not really ready for this challenge. I felt too confident and experienced, and now I'm starting to see the flaws in my plans. I think we have well, several questions within one question. <laughs> it, yeah, that, there's, there's, there's a lot of that. That's a kind of very confessional piece, which of course is, is, is I think that's that's really honest, um, because yeah, that the, 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 the part of me thinks that sort of if you have no fear, um, then you, you're willing to be radical. Once you start realizing how difficult it is, you become, and I use this this word in, in, a, in a very sort of advisory way. Um, um, yeah, you become disabled by the process. You start thinking of all the problems. But what I would say is that sort of, uh, and again, struggling to define the how. Well, of course, the how, as I say, that that's the sort of the the, the, the most appropriate methodology, um, and that's the epistemological question. But um, I'm just trying to de deconstruct this: how robust, robust the research should be in terms of data, and how many organisations. Well, that's a really difficult one. Yeah, if there are, it, it's a bit like uh, um, how many. Should I send that for it to be truly represented? He does that. You, you select a sample, and indeed, uh, and, and also, if you're doing, and it depends what you mean by organisations. Are you going to sort of to access them? I would say, um, if you're going to do that, and to, um, and it depends upon the amount of time you've got available. It's a handful. You can't research every every organisation in the depth that's required. So it's it's always this question of what is going to be sort of uh, give you sort of a, 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 a representative sample in the time that you've got available and you know, for arguments just to sort of to clarify when i did my piece of research i did a kind of longitudinal study i think it was 12 organizations but there were 12 individuals so it wasn't if i was trying to interview everyone because that would have been impossible and i had you know i went and talked to these people umpteen times over the per period of a couple of years and that gave me a you know a huge amount of data and allowed me to sort of to create the typology um, but if I'd been doing really deep case studies, I couldn't have. You know, it's just impossible. I think, and, and there are so there are doctoral pieces of work done on the basis of one organisation, and people say, "Well, hold on, but, but how can that be representative?" Well, it's not. It, 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 quite specifically and, and quite explicitly, you can only sort of demonstrate this of you understand deeply what's going on in that particular instance. You can't sort of claim that this is this is going to be um, representative of all organisations. And, and I think that, um, and the bit at the end, I mean, I, I well, yeah, okay, but you may not be ready for the challenge, but, but you know, the, I think the fact that you're now recognising this suggests that sort of the, the you uh, understand the magnitude of what, what you're attempting to do, and, and, and it should never be seen as trivial, and, and it's, it's a good thing, um, but, but, but the problem is, and of course, we, we, yeah, I've seen this lots of times, people, so they, they, they start to sort of to doubt um, that they can carry on. And that's when, um, yeah, all sorts of problems occur. People sort of often give up because they feel that they, they're not being supported, which just becomes sort of too big. It's a bit like a climb the mountain. You know, you get sort of um, halfway up and then you think, oh, I can't, don't think I can reach the peak. <laughs> uh, keep going is the sort of the answer. I hope that that helps. But but I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we had, uh, so Hal, he had his hand up a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> no, I, exactly. Um, but before I pass it exit to Sohil, let me just also uh, address exactly this 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 question. It's just like this is one of the reasons why we have the the, the clubs, and this is why we have you know like six clubs uh, combined with uh, with a special interests where you can just come in exactly discuss with peers. We will find always one of our mentors and coaches there so that exactly there are steps okay we we, we have a 25 journey uh, step uh, design so to say and exactly to take one by one what you just mentioned there is exactly first you know like you talk about framing your problem the scope of, of your research yeah so that we can move you um Together, you know, like that you will reach without, there is pain involved, you know, like I think that there is no other way of saying it. there is, it's a painful journey, but it's doable, okay? So 
don't exactly don't don't go to the other sides as steven says you know like keep going uh, come to our sessions join us at one of our club sessions and exactly let's let's keep that research going basically so Hill, sorry you can kind of make yourself to help okay okay so my question is about uh, well uh, when doing the research proposal, uh, I was wondering uh, well if the if the field I, I am intending to do uh, researching isn't uh, uh, isn't matching me uh, in a in a good way. Uh, I mean I have uh, some background. Uh, I believe you mentioned that you you had the background of an engineer. And then uh, switch it somehow to the, the, the domain. So my question is: Is it possible, or can I convince or write uh, a research proposal in a field which in, which isn't uh, uh, related uh, to 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 my scientific background or my background in general? I'm not, the, the, the acoustics weren't brilliant there, so I wasn't quite sure I fully understood that. I, I, did you hear it better, Anna? Uh, um, I think the, the question you... here is exactly, for instance, if you come from an engineering background, you know, like how suitable would it be if you decide to research, a, let's say, business or a management topic? Well, if oh, I, I tell you, that, that I, uh, okay, just, 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 just let me say this. I, I did my uh, PhD in uh, my background was in sort of construction engineering dare I say it and I end up sort of taking a sort of sociological approach now I have to say um, looking back and it is a really risky thing to do and I know for a fact because um, I was told this that sort of the, the internal examiner he, he, he didn't get it he, he, he said well this is not this is not uh, scientific and it was never meant to be because the, the the phenomena I was looking at it didn't lend itself to sort of to scientific approaches and, uh, uh, but again, I spent a lot of my the, the uh, methodology reflecting on the difficulty I had trying to sort of scientifically research something which was inherently about human interaction. So uh, it, 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 uh, hopefully that's inspirational. Um, breaking out of your discipline and recognizing the sort of limitations. I used it, I believe in it as a strength to say, well, you, you, you can't do this because you, you can't, you cannot create causality and therefore try something different. But, but again, also recognise that sort of um, when you break out of one discipline, people don't always. It, it, yeah, di disciplines can often be very sort of protective, or um, and, and that, 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 that word probably doesn't sort of summarise it. They 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 they, they don't recognise that there are always a range of approaches. So, so you're going to say something or come come back? Um, I'm, I'm here. Okay, so. Uh... Um, uh, well, well, my question here exactly. I'm trying to uh, to to change slightly my field. So uh, I will do some research in in, uh, in uh, alternative uh, fields. Uh, I'm basically a mecha mechanical engineer, and uh, I will try to do some IT and uh, integrate that. Uh, do a blend between between uh, between between both. So should I go go with it uh, when when I write my uh, my research proposal? Uh, should I focus on the, the my my mechanical background or should I do uh, a little bit of uh, I don't know courses in IT or just uh, go into into it? Yeah, well, like, again, I, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in one particular proposal, but what I would say is the sort of the big problem with IT is it's it's written by technical people on the assumption that people who are going to use it are highly technical. And, of course, the, the best IT, as we know, is in it, it, it's, it's not that it's so much intuitive, although it probably is. It kind of it works for sort of on the basis of, sort of you know, um, it's idiot proof. Uh, it, and if it doesn't work, uh, yeah, it's a bit like using computers. You know, we use them in our everyday lives because we don't have to think about what's going on in the surface, like driving a car. You, you don't have to drive a car. Uh, so you don't have to sort of understand the the the, um, the way in which a combustion engine works to drive a car. You know, you hit the, the you know the brakes, well, sorry, the, the accelerator makes it move forward, the gears make it move faster, and it's it's intuitive. And so so the, what am I saying here is that recognize that sort of the it's the interaction, if, if, if I understand correctly, it's the, sort of, um, the, the technical aspects, which is all very well, and that does whatever it does. It's designed to fulfill a particular purpose. But the, 
that when technology then is used by human beings, it has to sort of do different things. It has to be working in a way which suits the sort of the needs of average people. And let's face it, we're all average people. Um, and I think there's often a danger, if I may sort of make an observation, that technical people write things on the basis they're going to be um, used by some people who are, as, as, as ex have as much expertise as them. I hope that answers that. I'm, I'm conscious of time and, and, and uh, Jamilu has got have had their hand up for the last um, 10 minutes. So I'll come to that because we'll, we'll run out of time otherwise. So if, if, I, 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 so if, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, Jamilu. Thank you, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, mine is, uh, I have a question, sir. Uh, I'm actually uh, developing a proposal now and I'm working on the informal security um, community guards in the fight against insurgency in Nigeria, Boko Haram insurgency. And um, in my proposal, I actually identify stakeholders that I wanted to interview. One category of people that I want to talk to is the community leaders. The other category right. are security experts. And okay. then, of course, the, the participants, the guard vigilantes. Now, my question is this. Um, of course, in my pro, I, it's qualitative study, and then I intend to have uh, conduct interviews. Now, where am I having difficulty is trying to reconcile, do I need to have separate interview schedule for each category of uh, my respondents? Like, let's say, for example, the community leaders, the security experts, the, the volunteer guards, do I need to have separate interview schedule for, 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 for these different groups? Or one, one uh, interview schedule can serve the purpose? Uh, that is the question I have. Well, okay. I mean, I, I, again, it, this, oh gosh, there's, there's, there's a lot of um, warning signs going up here, but did, did you say that this involves Boko, Boko Haram? Sorry? You, yeah, yeah. The, is it, I, yes, but, actually. But, you, um, but just to ask the question, you don't intend to interview them, or okay. you do intend to? Okay. Well, well actually, the, these vigilantes they, they emerge a response to the Boko Haram violence, because at some point the, the Nigerian security, the former security, has failed to contain the violence of the group, and of course, owing to the nature of the insurgency, uh, intelligence is key, and uh, the way right. and manner na, na Nigeria respond to the issue of Boko Haram is that. Uh, most of the former security deployed to Boko Haram zone uh, don't really understand the culture, the language of the, the, the group, I mean, the, the society. So there was different culture, different group. They don't understand the language. They don't know much about the environment. So that is why it is very difficult for the former security to actually contain the violence of Boko Haram. Sure. So within this context, then the volunteers emerge. So when the volunteer group emerged, the, the, now, along the line, they started engaging in predatory behaviors, even the volunteer groups. So this is the, the, the area that I want to study, actually, the engagement of vigilantes in predatory behavior while trying to uh, counter the activities of Boko Haram. Gosh, right, okay, there's, there's a lot of um, um, ethical issues here. So, uh, uh, Anna, will you just excuse me for one, for 10 seconds? Will you, you, okay. you um, okay. I'll, I'll be back in a moment. Okay, sir. I'm going to ask Anna to, to comment on this one. I need to just do something. No, I think that's exactly, you, you had the question whether interviewing one person is enough. Yeah, it always depends on which problem are you looking into. So there is no straightforward, you know, like yes or no, because one will need to look at exactly what is the purpose of that interview. I, I remember that one of the issues that you had was exactly considering the, 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 the stakeholders that you'll be interviewing, also a question of security, also for those people that mm -hmm. exactly will be talking to you. So I can understand that you want, you know, like that desirably, you won't run too many interviews. Mm -hmm. The question is always, what is exactly the problem? What are what is exactly you know, like the questions that you are trying to 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 explore, and how many how many different opinions? Because I assume you we are dealing with something qualitative. Mm -hmm. So within qualitative research, we have you know like the saturation principle. So mm -hmm. how many would you need to interview to reach a point where there there is nothing new coming up? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So mm-hmm. it's it's not without looking exactly at what you are doing. It's 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 very it will be very responsible from our side to give you a yes no question. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, yes, actually, um, um, my my area of interest is how and why the reasons for the engagement of these guard or volunteers in predatory behaviors. And then how does this, uh, that actually impacted on human security in the affected states? And then of course, the, the last uh, things I'm interested in looking at is the issue of state response to these predatory activities of the vigilantes. So these are the three key areas that I'm interested in, interested in um, trying to explore. Why they engage in the predatory activities and then how it impacted in the human security in the affected communities, also states, and then um, how the government or state responds to, to such predatory behaviors. Yeah, but, okay. Big questions. No, exactly, Stephen, you, you, you were out exactly when, when I, I, I provide the first, uh, the initial answer, and exactly saying that is a bit, you know, like irresponsible for, from our end to give, you know, like one is a nut or, or not, yeah, so that exactly being a qualitative research so it's a question of saturation how, how far does it need to interview how far does it need to go um i don't know if you'd like to add something or a different perspective Stephen, to exactly what i already introduced well i mean the, the only question i would ask is uh, have you talked to a particular department about this research uh, or have you got a particular supervisor in mind sorry the, um, have you t- 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 approached a university or a, a department or indeed um, a particular supervisor about this work? Yes, but w- w- I have started developing the proposal. I haven't reached the level of submitting the complete uh, proposals. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I would suggest and strongly yes. suggest is that you talk to somebody with expertise in the area of um, researching. Uh, well, I, know, I, I was going to use the word terrorism, but but um, um, other people sort of regard it as differently. But but people with expertise in this area, they, they will guide you through what it is and what is not possible, given the sort of the huge ethical concerns. Um, because I, I know, for, for example, that people have done uh, work in um, this area at, at my own university, and there are always huge um, um, concerns about sort of, uh, yeah, I, I, and in fact, I, I think that sort of, certainly in my view, uh, a piece of work that you've outlined there, I don't think it would be um, approved by the, the Ethics Committee, because if, if not, only on the basis that it would expose the sort of the, the, um, the candidate to unnecessary risks yeah. Mm. And Jamie will exactly previous. We also show that concern, you know, like to keep how to protect the ones that exactly will be talking. Yes, the ethical issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know, absolutely. So you've got to think about this. But but hey, do, do I accept that there's a need to better understand the, sort of the motivations of those who engage in actions which um, have legitimacy in their eyes, but, but but maybe sort of condemned by others? Yeah, absolutely. We, 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 that's how we better understand how the world operates. Uh, and it's it's no bad thing. I I, I, I think think in summary, I'm really conscious of the fact that we've gone um, well over the deadline. Is that they um, it, it, to, you know, talking to the people, the, the people affected, i.e., those who sort of are the communities, that might be sort of the the, the best thing to do, um, and maybe not the protagonist, because of course that that's that's more problematic. But I think it's not really my area of expertise. I'm, I'm not going to sort of go be, any way beyond this. I would say talk to a, a potential supervisor and you know, just organise to have a sort of a also chat because they'll give you some sort of useful guidance. Also look into right. existing literature. How have they done it? You know, how have they managed yeah. to reach out and protect the ones that you are interviewing and still exactly add or, uh, to, to, to the knowledge of body that is on that area? Oh, thank you. I think we'll take okay. the last one, and at least then I'll switch off the recording. Otherwise, exactly, it will become too long. So yeah. please, uh, she, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you again. Uh, so my question was about I have, I, like I mentioned, that there's this area of interest that I have, and then when I start reading up on it, I find that everything that I wanted to do is has already been done like twenty years back, and this has happened twice with me like uh, earlier I was interested in something 
else in education then when i started reading up it looked like it's already done then i looked at another aspect and that is also been done so i don't know how to move forward mm <laughs> it's difficult yeah i mean yeah yeah i mean i, I it's it's it, all i can say is come back to the advice i gave you a couple of minutes ago which is to select one small aspect and it may seem um on the day you know first when when you think about it a bit trivial but by you know narrowly bounding it will we'll keep the sort of the, the research under control otherwise if you try and look at everything it will it, it's just impossible i i i, I think well that, i i hope that's helpful yes thank you any views anna no <laughs> i think that i will just exactly invite uh she Krishna, I, I, she Krishna, I, I'm, sorry if I'm not, if I'm not spelling your name, <laughs> I, I would invite you really to enroll in, in with our, you know, like issue identification course, yeah, because I, I, I'm confident that you'll find there a structured way of exactly trying to identify your research problem. It's, it's exactly takes you step by step and, and it challenges exactly already what you know about uh, your area. So I, I believe it could provide you a, a structure for you to, 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 to think about a potential problem in a structured way and, and exactly uh, go out of that loop that you, you seem to be caught into. I, I'm happy I'll, I will yeah. afterwards send you exact link uh, and post it at, at the forum. So please, you know, like it's it's self-study, you 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 know, like it's it's free, uh, freely available. Uh, go through it if you need exactly someone that exactly could walk you through. Also just just drop us a note. But read, you know, I like go through the contents, uh, answer, you know, because there, there is there are weekly tasks for you to 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 answer um, and see exactly where, where that takes you basically. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Jack, would you mind of switching the recording off, please?